good? Hello? Hello? So I've been hearing you are doing self-defense classes, right? How's that going? Can you defend yourself? How? Currently, one of, one of the most important things that we can do as Christians um, is to defend ourselves in faith as well. Um, if you believe in something and you cannot prove what you believe in, how true is your belief in that then? Right? So before we go, let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, that uh, we can just spend time in your presence. My prayer is that uh, our ears and our hearts and our eyes will be open to see what you want to show us. In Jesus' name, Amen. So just to quickly introduce myself, as uh, Pastor Lauren said, I'm Reino. I went to Poch Gymnasium. Woohoo! Woohoo! Not? Okay. Sorry. Uh, I was in high school with Louis, actually. We played rugby together. Um, so I at least know one faith in here. Uh, I then went on to study entrepreneurship and business management. I did my honours degree in that. Um, so I studied four years out of university. I started my own company. Uh, we did alternative energy products. Did that for eight years. But uh, I was tired of sitting on someone's roof and installing solar panels. But, um, in Poch, you'll know that in the summer it's not the best place to be. I was also part of a band, or still, um, called One Crown. We, we did the whole rock star thing for Jesus though. Um, traveled the country. Uh, in 2000, I think it was 2012, we won Best Rock Album of the Year Award. We were nominated uh, against Van Kouk Artel. So, small little Christian band from Poch won against big secular band. Um, so, that was something major. So, I've been been busy with a lot of things um, but there's always one, one question that I asked and that question has led me to the point where I'm now full time pastor on my way to New Orleans and the United States the state of Louisiana and that's the question on the board the question on the screen a question that, that changed my life who is Jesus? and I think you are allowed to answer in this room right? Are you? Or is it just me speaking like a comedy show and you're not allowed to say anything? Not? Okay. So if I would ask the question today, who is Jesus? Can you guys give me a couple of answers? That's, that's not a, like a rhetorical question. That's, can you please give me a couple of answers? Yes. The Son of God. The Son of God. Awesome. Yep, it's all correct though. Okay. Cool. More questions? He is God. So it's, it's crazy this question because the exact same question Jesus asked to his disciples. Okay? So in Mark 8. Uh, I think it's 26, 27, Jesus asked this question to his disciples, who do people say I am? You know, who do the people say I am to them? And then the disciples gives, they give a couple of answers, and then Jesus takes it a bit further, he makes it a bit more personal to the disciples, and he asks them, who do you say I am? Now obviously this was before Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead, so they did not necessarily have all the information, but Peter then answered, says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Remember, he did not see the evidence of Jesus being the Messiah. And then Jesus replied and says, Blessed are you, because no man has given this to you. It came from God. This wisdom that you have, saying that I'm the Messiah, God must have given it to you. And based on this, upon this rock, I will build my kingdom. Now, the word Peter means rock. And Jesus did not say that upon Peter, you know, I will build my church. He meant that based on 
this confirmation or based on this knowledge, based on this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, I will build my rock or I will build my, my house, my kingdom. So if we want to give an answer to who Jesus is, if we want to stand for Christianity, the attack will always be upon the identity of Jesus, right? Because that, that is what our Christianity, our faith, is based upon, is the fact that Jesus came as the Son of God, He died, three days later He rose from the dead, proving that He is the Son of God, offering freedom and salvation to everyone who believes in Him. So if someone wants to oppose our Christianity, they're going to go to that very same point. Because if Jesus didn't die, what's the basis of our Christianity? If Jesus did not raise, or if Jesus wasn't rose from, or risen from the dead, sorry, I'm between Afrikaans and English, if Jesus didn't rise out of the tomb, then again, it disproves that He is the Son of God which basically just means that he was a human being. And that is some of the assumptions or the accusations that people who do not believe in Jesus state and say, hey, that, you know, maybe he wasn't really dead. Maybe he wasn't really buried. Maybe he just faked his own death. He was never buried and the people saw him afterwards. So today I want to go into a bit of that because in Hebrews 11... It says that whoever comes to Jesus must believe that He is and must believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So when I come to Jesus, I need to have two things in place. I must have a belief, a factual belief of who He is. I must have evidence to say that this is, this is who Jesus is. I must be able to give an answer that this is the Son of God. This is why I believe he was dead. This is why I believe he did die on a cross and this is why I believe that he rose from the dead. Secondly, I must also believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and that I can only do in faith. Take for example any normal human relationship. Who of you guys are in relationships? Just quickly. Okay, so in order to be in that relationship, there's two stuff that you need to have. Now, I know you're not married now, and please keep it for a couple of years still, um, or wait a couple of years. But when I propose to my wife, I believe that she is. I could see her physically. I know who she is, where she comes from, what her beliefs are. I know that she likes peace. Pasta more than pizza, sorry. Um, so I, I have evidence for her existence. I believe that she is. And then I also in faith believe that this is going to turn out good. I had no promise, I had no evidence that she won't cheat on me 5 or 10 or 20 years down the line. I had no proof of how that relationship will be, but I had faith that it will turn out good, right? Right? So the same way, when we come to Jesus and we want to be in a relationship with Jesus, we need to have that same two stuff. We need to know that He is. He's not just something that your mom made up, the same way that she spoke about Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. Sorry, that I just burst someone's bubble. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Um, the, the Tooth Fairy is not real, okay? We'll pray for you afterwards. So we must believe who Jesus is, who He was, what He did. And then secondly, we must also have a belief or a faith that I'm going to go into this relationship. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to pan out like, but I need to believe that in faith, God will still be good towards me. So does that make sense? Two points. Sorry? So again, as I said, the foundation of our Christianity 
is, is found in Mark, in Mark 8. Uh, Jesus saying, saying to his, his disciples that based on this, I will build my church. So when the enemy comes, he will go on that very same detail. Him being the Son of God, dying on a cross, and then three days later, being raised from the dead. So in order for us to disprove, so you, you, you're seeing that I'm, I'm coming from the other side of the bush today, right? In order to disprove Jesus as the Son of God, we need to do three things. We need to say that the tomb wasn't empty. We have to say there were no eyewitnesses. And then, what is the result of the resurrection? So this is the approach of people that say, Christ didn't die, didn't exist, he, didn't ra he wasn't raised from the dead. And according to those points, they say that Christianity can't be real. So for me to say Christianity can be or is real, I need to look and I have, need to have an answer for the next three points. So the first one I want to give you, and, and a lot of people or someone actually asked me, how, how can we believe the Bible if it's just a couple of books that have been put together and there's no real historical evidence or proof that this actually is the truth. I want to read to you the statement. The New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work, having over 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and 9,300 manuscripts in very various other ancient languages. The only other book that compares in times of, or in terms of how old the book is, has got nine ancient manuscripts. The Bible has got 5,800. So just to prove, they say that in order to, to say that the original book was true, the manuscript, so the manuscript was literally like a copy of the original. The closer the manuscript is to the original, the more true it is. And the more manuscripts we have of the original, the more true it is. Okay? So we're looking at age and volume, or years and volume. And here we can see that we've got 5,800, and the closest manuscript is about 50 years after the original was written. So just throwing that in there, make notes. If someone says, hey, how can you believe the Bible? How can you say that it's true? There it is. So, um, quickly back to our three points. A lot of people will say Jesus isn't the Son of God because the tomb was not empty. Remember what happened? Jesus was buried. Three days later, a couple of ladies came to the tomb and they found it to be empty, which proves the fact that he has been risen from the dead. Right? You with me? Or are you self-defending? Not there? Yeah? Okay? So, the argument is that if we can prove that the tomb wasn't empty, then Jesus isn't the Son of God. And remember, we are speaking about who is Jesus. If Jesus is the Son of God, then He was raised out of the dead, and then proving He is the Son of God. So, the first point on the empty tomb is that the place that they buried Jesus wasn't a far off desolate place. It was the same, same place where Jesus performed a lot of miracles. So they assume or they say that some disciples or some of the people that went and buried Jesus took him to a very far off place. And therefore no real evidence exists on the basis that the tomb is empty. But as a matter of fact, if it was not in Jerusalem, they couldn't have kept it quiet for, for a single day. Because everyone knew about the or the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. And therefore, the, the news spread so rapidly because it was in the very same city. 
The second argument is, uh, sorry, I just want to go down. The second argument is that Jesus was never in the tomb. Jesus didn't really die. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. Uh, he faked his own death. He never went in there. And therefore, it's easy to say, hey, the tomb is empty. Now, if we go back to the crucifixion, remember that the guys that crucified Jesus, this was their job. Okay? Not the best job to have. I know that you are doing some career counseling, so please don't go into that. Because that, this was literally the job that these guys had to do. <coughs> Professional executioners. So when they executed someone or crucified someone, after a while, to just to make sure that this guy that they have been crucified or they crucified, they would break his legs. Okay? So the tension on your muscles, on your shoulders and, and pectoral area, was so heavy that you literally couldn't inhale. It's like if you have a, a fat brother and you wrestle him or he wrestles you and he sits on your chest you can't inhale nay I'm seeing some some highly emotional kid wounds coming up right now because of that fat brother wrestling you but when someone sits on your chest you can't inhale because your body is basically locked in an exhale position you can try this afterwards um, sit on one another Things are going south at Equilibria. Someone driving past and seeing the kids sitting on one another. That would be a picture. So he was basically locked, or people ex uh, crucified was locked in this position. So in order to inhale, you would drag yourself, push yourself up. Remember, there's a nail in your feet and in your wrist. Pull yourself up so that you can inhale and then go down again. But remember when Jesus went to the cross, the beating, some doctors say that the beating that he got before the cross was enough to, to kill him. So his back was literally lashed open. Literally. Um, at the end of the strings there were sheep, sharp sheep bones and small metal balls, which meant that when you hit him and you pull back, it ripped off the flesh of his back. Okay? So Passion of the Christ, you can see the whole picture. So if Jesus wanted to breathe, he had to pull himself up, scratch his back, that open back against bare wood, just in order to breathe. Okay? So tension on your chest, couldn't breathe. So in order to make sure that you are dead, they would break your legs, just for that final dropping, that final tension. When they came to Jesus, they saw, remember, professional executioners, They've done this a couple of times. They saw that it's not even necessary to break his legs. I just this morning read an article of a doctor that said that Je Jesus didn't die on the cross. Again, professional executioners, they saw that it's not necessary to break his legs. And that's why they took the spear. Now, we're going into a bit of medical terms now, and I'm not sure if I can even remember it, but the evidence of the water and the blood rushing out was just evidence that, that Jesus died. I'll give you the term maybe afterwards. I don't have internet now, so I won't be able to look it up. So Jesus did die. He went into the tomb. Another reason why we can believe that Jesus went into the tomb was there was a guy that was not one of his disciples, uh, Joseph. The Aramatia. Uh, he was part of uh, the Sanandrum, Jewish Sanandrum, which is a council, and he was there with, with Jesus. So if it was a conspiracy theory that these disciples made up, this is one guy that stood without or outside this whole group of disciples, which just further states that he indeed was buried. Um, sorry, ladies, this is going to be personal. But in that day, we did not believe women, all right? 
if if you as a woman wanted to say something no one believed you you didn't have a say in society you had no place in society so a lot of these guys that that want to disprove Jesus actually being resurrected remember it was women that saw him the first time they will say that the tomb was discovered by women so we're not supposed to believe them if you look at that from the other side if this was a conspiracy why would we then elect women to say that the tomb is empty if we wanted people to believe our conspiracy why would we choose women to say Jesus saw him or saw the tomb empty for the first time uh, another article that I found that wants to state that it is a conspiracy says that there's a lot of indifferences within the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke and John so here we find four stories four eyewitness accounts on the fact that we saw Jesus again and he says based on the indifferences we can surely say that it can't be true because the stories don't line up um, it's actually a proven point in law that if you want to state a case and all your personal testimonies your eyewitness accounts are exactly the same you should ask questions because then they have conspired with one another to say that let's lie about this um, so even even by law that whole argument has been dismantled so do we have any questions based on the empty two anyone any thoughts in case you would like to be lying down in the tomb right now not dead though just lying down no questions okay let's go to the to the next one and this this is the point that if we can we don't have to prove anything but if people want to disprove that Jesus or if they can disprove that Jesus was re resurrected then we can disprove him as the Son of God now there was about 500 people that saw Jesus after being resurrected mainly the disciples and they saw him a couple of times spent time with him and in order for these guys to say that we saw Jesus it had to be either the truth or they were lying or they hallucinated these are the points that people want to use to disprove Jesus as the Son of God okay they lied they hallucinated or they actually did see him on the first point they lied now I don't know if you know but 10 of the 12 disciples were martyred they were beaten killed um, in different forms different ways based on the fact that they believed they saw Jesus Christ now how many of you would be willing to die for a lie How many of you would be willing to die for a lie? A lot of people have died because they thought it was the truth. But here are ten guys. They saw Jesus. And they were willing to die because it was the truth for them. They saw Jesus resurrected. No one's willing to die for a lie. And these ten guys, the same thing they did not die for a lie they di died for a truth the second point that people want to make is they say they hallucinated now I just want to read you this from a psychologist um, uh, I'm going to give it to you now sorry Oh, a psychologist says that 
it's impossible for two people to have the exact same hallucination. It's impossible. Um, people also cannot hallucinate something that they've never heard or seen before. So you can al hallucinate something that has happened in your consciousness or you've read about it, you've seen it, then you can hallucinate it. So again, that myth that all the disciples, all the people that saw Jesus hallucinated um, after being resurrected, uh, disproven again. And then the, the third point then is that they must have indeed seen Jesus resurrected. Then the last one is the effect of Jesus being raised from the dead. And that is, that's the first, or the third point then that we can make is if this didn't happen, why then has Christianity spread so rapidly? If this instance of Jesus died, went to the grave, resurrected, if this instance didn't happen, why then did Christianity spread so rapidly? Answer? Is there someone that has an idea? Because something had to influence the spread of Christianity. Holy Spirit, which then just again proves, because Jesus said that I will pour out my Spirit. If you go back into history, you'll see that there are a lot of myths and um, stories about people dying and resurrecting, but none with so much evidence as Christianity. There's a lot of stories after uh, Jesus. Um, saying that we also have a Messiah, we also have this and we will also see him being resurrected but only after Christianity was established um, just to say again that the only influence that, that could ensure the spread of Christianity was it mere human was it other religions or was it in fact Jesus himself truly dying and resurrecting from the dead and these are three very independent facts um, the fact that Jesus was indeed dead um, the fact that the tomb is empty the fact of the eyewitnesses um, that stand independently from one another if we have to take one and elaborate on one it can prove that Jesus was the son of God but when we throw them all together, it just proves again that, or it proves that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was born in the form of a man. He came to earth and he re-established what God initiated in Genesis 1.26. So God being true to his word, giving dominion on earth to us as, as humans, Jesus had to come again in the form of a man and then I want to end off with with a question again today so I was a bit under my time we'll open up for a couple of questions but I want to ask this question the very same question that Jesus asked to his disciples and only when Jesus saw in the eyes and the understanding of his disciples of who he really is only then he told them that on this truth I will build my church. So the only way that the church can stand is based on that truth, that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. So if the enemy, and I'm saying the enemy, but when people come and they ask you, why do you believe? We need to have, we need to have the answer. What is that rock that I'm standing on? Is it just something that I was taught? Is it just something that uh, I picked up when I was small? Or is it actually that I firmly believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That He really died and it's not just He passed out. 
Is it that the tomb was really empty? Is it that the Bible is just a couple of books that someone put together? Or is it that I really truly believe that it is God-inspired scriptures? So I'm going to end off with giving you guys the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Hopefully, um, I know this was a bit more of an intellectual, apologetic approach. Um, but I, what I truly believe is, is we should have both. Same way that I saw in, or said in, in Hebrews, that when we come to Jesus, we must know that He is and He is a rewarder of those who dil- diligently seek Him. It's fact and faith. We cannot just live by faith and not have the facts. Because then we don't have an answer when someone asks us. And when we only have fact, then we don't have the relationship because there's no expectation in faith. So hopefully that's the idea of today is, is to help you guys understand that we need to have fact and faith. So, any questions? Yes. Jesus to me is the Son of God. And yes, He did die and He is risen. Currently seated at the right hand of God. And He contains all authority. More questions? Louis, Marquay, Sunay, Anna. It's easy with your names in front of you, okay? I can point anyone else. Carla, Le Frochi Fro. It's okay. I just want to make this point that um, it's, it's very interesting when you look at non-biblical evidence for Jesus' existence. So there's two major ones. Um, I'm going to struggle to give the names. The first one uh, is Tacitus. I think that's how you pronounce it. He was a non-Christian Roman. Um, and then the other one was a Jewish guy uh, with the name Josephus. And these are the two major ones. So I'm going to give you, I think it's seven facts, eight, nine, ten facts that they, that they both write about Jesus and there's confirmation that both of them had the same idea, said that he existed as a man. So, you know, they both wrote about him, proving his existence. Um, his name was Jesus. He was called Christ. Um, he had a brother named James. Uh, he won over both Jews and Greeks. So this is just a, a summary of, of the stuff that they had the common idea about who Jesus was. Jewish leaders of the day expressed unfavorable opinions about him. Pilate rendered him or rendered the decision that he should be executed. His execution was specifically by crucifixion and he was executed during Pontius Pilate's governorship over Judea. Um, and then we can go on and on and on. Thales, which basically lived in the same day and age as Jesus, um, said, On the whole world they pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. 
this darkness tell us in the third book of his history calls as appears to me without reason an eclipse of the sun so one of the cases that I actually read um, you know if you if you can't uh, if you can't nullify Jesus as the son of God with the resurrection the tomb the death let's go to something like um, there was a solar eclipse for three hours so this one guy says that if there was a solar eclipse why is there no one else outside the Bible that actually writes about it? And here we see historian Thales, uh, which basically lived in the same day and age as Jesus, writes about it. He says, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. Um, Tacticus, which lived um, from 56 to 120 AD, uh, he says, Jesus lived in Judea, was crucified under Pontius Pilate and had followers who were persecuted for their faith in Christ. Um, Non-Christian guy that writes something about Jesus and his disciples. And we can go on and on. Here's another one, uh, 70 AD. Uh, Plagon, I don't know if you, some of you guys have heard of Plagon. Also, um, you know, a scholar outside of the Christian faith. He says, um, also talks about the full eclipse of the sun. He also says that, and with regard to the eclipse of the time of Tiberius Caesar, in whose reign Jesus appears to have been crucified, and the great earthquakes which then took place. Jesus, while alive, was no assistance to himself, but that those he arose after death and uh, exhibited or exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. Non-Christian guy that lived between 80 and 140 AD that says that Jesus had indeed died and was risen again and you could see the marks on his hands. So, I mean, you can go into the detail of, of reading about guys outside of the, the religious framework that actually do attest to the existence of Jesus. So, if you don't have any questions, yes, sorry you. It was his physical body that went to heaven. I got the question the other day why did David pick up five stones if he knew that he only would use one <laughs> maybe he had big hands <laughs> but there's actually a reason for that so why did Jesus have to die oh this is a long one so Jesus actually went in to hell, into Hades, because okay, we're going back now, Genesis. In Genesis, God gave man authority on earth. So God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So the same way that God rules in heaven, he gives us authority to rule on earth. So he made us to be kings on earth. Okay? He made us to represent Him and to be in a relationship with Him. When the serpent came, we basically gave away that dominion to the devil. Okay? So remember, God created man to represent God on earth. Man, not God. Okay? God can intervene, but He had to do it through man. And that's why Jesus was born a physical human, the very same way you and I are humans. Because God created humans, man, to rule on earth. 
But the enemy had dominion, basically what Adam and Eve gave away. The enemy, the devil, had that. And that's why Jesus went down into hell, into Hades, to go and take back the authority. The reason why he took back the authority is because he is the Son of God. Death couldn't kill him. And that's why he proves that he is the Son of God, because he raised from the dead. Uh, so that's why he had to die, because he literally went into hell to fight the battle for us and to, f to get back whatever was taken from Adam and Eve. Okay? More question? Yes. So Jesus, um, do you mean in terms of only a couple of days? Well, I believe it's to restore what God initially intended for us. So God wanted us to be the rulers, the kings on earth, if you know what I mean. So um, Jesus had a very special assignment to come down to restore what was lost, what was originally given to us, and then to go back, because that was his assignment. His assignment was never to become a human and live among us. The assignment was very specific, to give back what was taken from us. So he, he basically did his job. And, yeah, he did his job. So we can find in John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus is the Word of God and He's been there from the very beginning. So a lot of people say that, or a lot of people have the perception that Jesus is a solution to a problem. And it's not true. Jesus is not God's plan to fix a problem. Um, if you go and look at Genesis 1, it says, like us make man in our image and our likeness. Speaking about the triunity of God or the triunion God Father, Father, Son and Holy Spirit and I believe that um, it was might not be biblical but I believe it was Jesus stepping up to the plate and saying hey I will, I will go and do this I will go and rectify what has been lost so we've got Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit um, Jesus is the Word of God coming in the form of man in flesh to live among us. So He is the Word of God and He manifested Himself as a human being to live on earth. And then the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God which empowers us to do the very same thing that Jesus did. Okay. So Jesus not... Uh, you can see the picture as Oh yes, you know, don't fight Mark. Now tell the And and now now God needs to come up with a solution, stating that God might have been outplayed by the enemy, which is not the case. Jesus has always been part of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so Jesus is not the solution, but He came and brought the solution for us. questions? None? Is there might be someone that has a bit more clarity today about who Jesus is? And I think it's, it's something that happens very naturally within South Africa because we grow up in a traditionally um, Christian country or Christian home. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, yeah, I can live in a Christian house, so we, we grow 
up with the idea of Jesus but we have never really thought about details like was he really dead because if he wasn't dead then he's not resurrected and if he's not resurrected then he isn't the son of God um, was it just a conspiracy theory I mean let's, let's make up uh, a person call him Jesus and tell everyone about him we grow up with Jesus in our homes and we don't think about questions like this. And then someone asks us and then we're like, um, my mom may have told us. Was it like Right. If that is it, thank you guys. Thank you, Pastor Lawrence.